So welcome to It's Not All About The Numbers, the leadership podcast that doesn't just focus on the bottom line. Hi, my name is Chris and that is Mike. Hi everyone. And our co-host today is John Lees, career strategist and author of How To Get A Job You Love, which was a bestseller by all accounts. Welcome, John. Hi, Chris. Hi, Mike. Great to be with you. Thanks very much. Well, we'll jump straight into our weeks. Um, and I'm definitely not going to go first because uh, I'm, I'm quite low on energy today, but I'll come on to that. Mike, how has your week been? So, so you've come straight to me who... In my my first thing is I've been ill all week, so yeah. I, so I've, I've I've had a week where I've been coughing and not sleeping, and been trying to navigate through mind fog, and having that kind of weird sensation of being. So I'm a freelancer, so I've got work that I've got to get done. So I can't have sick days. I've got to still crack on with the work. So it's been been an interesting week, and I've got to, I've got to sit down over the weekend and work out well, what did I did and I. Did I do and did I not do that? I needed needed to get finished, but I'm on the mend. Um, and actually, I'm really looking forward to this afternoon because my two sons are currently on the train up from Dorset, and we're meeting in London, and we're going to go to the Formula One simulator in St Paul's this afternoon. So that's something to look forward to. So I'm not allowed to be in anymore. That sounds great. That sounds great. It's it's so true what you say about being. And John, I'm sure I'm sure you relate to this. Being a consultant or a freelancer, when you get paid by the day, you're not allowed to take a sick day or you really, really have to be ill to take that day off. Um, I've definitely been there before. Um, John, how's your week? It's been great. It's been uh, an interesting mix of things. Uh, and I guess that's what I like about my work is it is varied. So I ran a, an online career management workshop for a big financial company. Uh, I've done so a couple of executive coaching sessions with people who are having difficult conversations, difficult relationships at work, and some career coaching today for somebody who's a data analyst, actually, who's trying to get his career back on track. And I'm coaching him in the art of soft networking. So maybe something out of that mix of things we could be talking about later on today. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I'm, I'm I I love, I love, I love the idea of soft networking. Chris and I talked previously about about my, my kind of well, I think of it as hard networking. My loathing of walking into a room full of people that I don't know and and actually having to kind of start networking. So yeah, definitely would like to dig into that a little bit. That's great. Right. We'll we'll come on to that definitely. Um, as I agree with you, Mike. That's uh, that's right up my street. But um, but let's have a quick look at what's happened uh, this week. All sorts happening. Uh, this this week in the world, but there was a really interesting um, article that I saw um, last week. We were talking about uh, being a specialist and a generalist, um, and you know, are you are you one or the other, or can you be both, and all the rest of it. Um, and I think Mike was saying he was a specialist. I think I was more of a generalist. And this article caught my eye, which uh, John, I know that you've you've seen, um, which was about the the rise of the know it all. And I kind of linked that to the specialist a little bit, but there was this interesting, um, and that's not a dig, Mike. Uh, <laughs> you know, there was the article saying that the CEO of Whole Foods um, was basically saying it's the least favourite sort of type of person that he he likes to work with. Well, it's an interesting example of the way my week sometimes unfolds because I was given about 20 minutes notice to contribute to that article. and um, And it turned out to be quite well syndicated across the world. So it's been reposted in lots of different places and quite fun to contribute to. So, yeah, the initial premise was that know-it-alls obviously can sometimes get up people's noses and it's almost the wrong position to take. So what I tried to do was to sort of demonstrate the nuance, really, in terms of how you share knowledge at work in a way which is appropriate sometimes, doesn't rub somebody's nose in it, doesn't point out someone else's deficiencies, if you like, um, how often you do it, you know, it, it, and it's, for me, that's quite a good example of the kind of work I do as an executive coach sometimes about, which is about tone, really, about, you know, mm. understanding how to pitch things and how, how relationships can go wrong and how they can go right. And um, so it, I mean, what the article essentially says, it, it points to is to somebody that's already um, being an irritant and that's interesting too because that in a way becomes your reputation at work doesn't it so where does the line 
begin and end between somebody who's who really knows stuff and is useful to have around and somebody that says rather too often um i used to do you know i, I know all about this or uh, i always did this when i worked for my big last employer and yeah. everyone around it just feels sort of a real sense of irritation every time they hear that that's really interesting i i, I was thinking when, when i saw this article and i was thinking about people that i've worked worked with before and, and who are the best people to work with them for? And and it's the people that are actually humble about their knowledge. So actually, they might be massively experienced in something, but they they actually their first their first step is to listen. They they don't wade in with that kind of like oh when I was at so and so I did this. They 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 come at it from a a listening perspective, and they might steer a conversation. So linking much more to that kind of coaching approach. Um, but, and I think that yeah that that was my take on it that. The, the know-it-all is the person that projects their knowledge without listening to their audience, I suspect. Yeah, and it doesn't, you know, in this world, I think collaboration is essential <laughs> in all roles. And it doesn't present the right, quite the right image, does it? I, You know, we talked a lot about, um, you know, the T-shape, having the, the broad experience as well as the functional kind of specialism. Um, but it's almost like they're forgetting about the T and they're just focused on their specialism. Because you've got to collaborate, you know, in this world. And if people don't feel that they can collaborate, you that there's a risk. Do do you think this is a sort of, you know, is this common in in the leadership world, or do you think this is almost like an early career learning that you know you basically stop being a stop being a bit of a know it all? You know, John, what's your experience when you talk to people? I think you might be right. I think there are certain career stages where you learn when to keep your mouth shut. Uh, when to hold back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I also learned how to land things. So in that article that you referenced from, I think it's from fortune.com, one right, thing man. that I was saying is, you know, you can just simply say it might be helpful if, or here's an idea we could try, or you might get some value out of this, which is a really different way of pla planting information rather than saying I know the answer or just jumping straight in with the sort of pre-cooked um, solution. And I think you're right. Yeah, I think it is. It's, it's one of those formative stages that we people need to go through. And if you don't go through them, things start to go wrong because it does affect your reputation and does affect the way that you are seen by senior decision makers inside an organization. Yeah. And these people are well-meaning, right? You know, if I've got knowledge and something worked in the past, you know, your experience, then it's right to share it. Um, I suppose, like you say, it's just how it lands. Go on, Mike. But, uh, I was going to say there's something in there around the, the openness to feedback and being prepared to to listen to feedback. So when, when you said there's these stages in your career and you, you learn when to shut up, I'm, thinking, I'm just wondering whether I've got there yet. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping <laughs> that I have. Um, but but it definitely for me is that listening to feedback and being open open to what people are saying to you, I think is, is the key bit. That's It's a really interesting point though, because I think I, I've... I've become more open to feedback the further on I've got in my career. And there's some kind of irony in that um, because, I don't know, you, there's almost this expectation that the boss knows more, the boss knows everything. But actually, um, you know, I, I know a lot, but it's actually how we get things done as a team and the collaboration and the dynamics and the new knowledge that I want, you know, and it's definitely not just telling people what to do, which I think can be what you think in early years is what's needed to get to the top. Um, actually, just, you know, having great open conversations all the time, you're going to learn an awful lot more. Um, I did realise as well that I completely forgot to tell you about my week. Uh, <laughs> and there's a reason for that. Um, because we had an amazing night last night. This week's been all about the Digital Finance Function Awards. We call them the Jennies. And um, I was hosting it last night and it went on to the early hours. Uh, so <laughs> forgive me for missing this bit and uh, and my voice. Um, but it was fantastic. It was a really good night. It was a celebration of um, close to 200 people, just transformers and change makers coming together to really sort of celebrate and support each other. Um, one tip, though. The, the branding for the event was black and pink. Um, and I'd just say, if anyone has you a pink drink ever, 
do not drink it. Um, it's 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 not going to be blancmange, and uh, it's yeah, it was. Um, I think it was the beginning of the end <laughs> when I saw that one. Um, and it was really interesting last night. I don't know, John. I don't know whether you've you, you've had this experience because I imagine a lot of what you do is online um, as well as in person. But last night, I, I had met loads of people online and through their LinkedIn profiles and things like this. But when I met them in person, they were so different. <laughs> and it was like, and it wasn't just the the ten year old picture on their profile. People were like, oh, you're so tall. Oh, you you know, I'm so sure and all this sort of stuff. And I know we talk about it all the time, but I think, you know, people really need to make an effort to update their pictures um, because sometimes you don't even recognize people. Um, and I hope you don't mind me saying, John, I'm looking at you now on this screen and I've got an image of you being over six foot. Right. <laughs> but that could be completely wrong. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm obviously projecting tall, which is it means it's working. No, I'm, yeah. I'm five foot ten, so you're all right. <laughs> there you go. It's it's it cl close enough. I, I've definitely had it since since working on Zoom I, on my my webcam at home. It's slightly up. People meet me and go, "Blimey, you are tall!" You know, because I'm I'm six two, and because because the camera looks down on me, I think people think I'm shorter than I am. So. Yeah, you know, it's it's quite fun when you uh, end up looming over people and they're not expecting it. Yeah, I, I'm, you know, my entry song last night was a man in finance, six foot five, and I'm definitely not. Um, I'm only six one. But uh, anyway, so there's a bit of a request to probably uh, everyone update your, your profile pictures um, uh, because, uh, yeah, people would just, you know, have a better introduction, I think, and and avoid pink drinks. Anyway, enough about that. So, go on, Mike. I was going to say, I just wanted to loop back round. You've just given us feedback around pink drinks and feedback around profile. And I actually wanted to ask John, I just wanted to loop back round to the, 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 the feedback question. So I'm really interested. So for me, coaching is all about feedback. It's all about being able to put message, messages across in a way which is gentle. And I really am intrigued. How did you get into it? What was the what was the thing that you learned that you could do in terms of giving feedback? Because you must be really good at it. I hope so, <laughs> or at least good at it. Um, well, my story in a nutshell is that I spent the first phase of my career working in learning and development and largely training recruiters. So training them to be better interviewers and sometimes to be slightly better human beings as well. And what I got interested in was the people on the other side of the desk. So being able to work with those people to say, you're just about to go into a selection process. Do you understand what the recruiter is looking for? Do you understand what mind game is they going to play with you? And also some of the strange questions they'll ask you. And that sort of expanded outwards into an idea around helping people who want to change careers. So that's the thing that really interests me. And most of our clients come with that statement when they say, I want to do something completely different, but I don't know what it is. So uh, how does that relate to feedback? Well, it does, isn't it? Because it, we talked about learning stages and we talked about the importance of getting objective and useful feedback. And I think what's behind that question is that uh, often that's absent. So I, either the feedback is absent or people don't know how to hear it. So one of the things I often recommend for people who are at kind of career development stages inside organizations, they're just looking up and ahead, is I say work with a mentor. You know, mentors are really, really good at saying this is how you are seen by other people. This is your reputation at the moment. And if you want to change it, this is some of the stuff you have to do. And uh, so I've seen really, really useful things about that. I'm also very aware of how little feedback people get in so many other parts of of um, the whole process of career change, for example. So if you go to an organization and you have an interview, the only feedback you'll get afterwards is that we saw people better than you. <laughs> That's pretty much all they're allowed to say. Mm. So, you know, you actually have to do things uh, consciously to find someone who can give you honest feedback about the way you're getting ideas across and the way you're selling yourself or communicating a strong message. And and that's quite rare unless you do something about it for yourself, which is sort of the first stage of taking active control, I think, really, is it's finding somebody to give you honest and useful feedback. Yeah. It's a really, uh, you just, really interesting sort of assessment of that. And I, I think you said something in there, which I just want to push on a little bit. So when people talk about feedback, they kind of talk about, you know, how you give feedback and, 
you know the the right way to say it and you know is it good news bad news or or do you sort of open up with a can i give you some feedback and then they invite it in but actually you said something in there which was the recipient needs to learn how to hear it as well so what's the what's the onus on on the person receiving it because they haven't necessarily welcomed it they're not necessarily ready for it mm-hmm. um what do they do well some of it falls on the coach but, but i guess you, you you're sort of hinting at that anyway but just dwell on that for a second because it it is important that feedback lands well and it needs to be sort of clean information and it allows somebody to take the personal out of it um so it, and sometimes you don't always do it in the moment. So I remember a really good learning model was, you know, particularly if somebody's done a public performance, they've given a talk. The worst thing to do is to uh, almost catch them as they're walking away from the podium and say, let me tell you three things you did wrong there. <laughs> You've got to leave it 24 hours. You've got to let thing, the experience settle in. But yeah, I think... John, it, were, you, were you there last night by any chance? <laughs> 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 because that is almost exactly what happened last night. Really? Um yeah, so well, you know, I I I I'm talk on the podcast quite regularly. You know, I present on an online and offline infrequently though, really. Um, and then the awards is kind of annually. So I'm definitely not used to getting up on stage, hosting, you know, everything basically for an hour across 14 awards, lots of moving parts, and lots of different reasons for people coming up. So I do welcome the feedback and it, you know, it takes a lot out of me to actually do that. I'm not, you know, a professional presenter or anything. But so, but actually it's sort of careful what you wish for, because I had a few people in the audience who I knew were, you know, almost like my, my buddies in terms of constructive feedback, but it was straight after, literally after I got off the, um, the stage and I won't mention their names, but it was difficult to hear what was being said, uh, not because I had a glass of champagne in my hand, but, you know, it was just the wrong timing. Um, but what I what I really appreciated, actually, and, you know, this isn't just blowing smoke for Mike, but Mike actually said, well done, and then walk with me and let's just take a moment to listen to the vibe after the ceremony. And I took five minutes with Mike to just listen, really, to this noise of of joy and you know just it was wonderful to hear and that actually the feed that feedback to me was more powerful than anyone saying well you know you could have moved the podium or you know you, you, you we could have had an mc helping you out and all that sort of stuff so um timing's important right i totally agree and it, it may, reminds me how much feedback and confidence are related to each other and how easy it is to damage confidence with uh, feedback which is timed wrongly or or not particularly useful. Um, because we have to remember that an awful lot of people are constantly jumping at shadows. I mean, probably something like half the working population are, are in the introvert range. And that often means that they're quite susceptible, quite vulnerable to external feedback. Uh, and even in a, in a sort of... Um, a low key way that affects them. Sometimes it really affects people's performance. So one of the tools I often use with people is to, to think about how they absorb an experience. And a model I've used more than once is something in positive psychology, which is about reviewing things just once. Okay, so you you make a difficult uh, presentation in a meeting. It doesn't go as well as you'd like it to. Maybe there's a colleague in the room and give you some feedback afterwards. Maybe there isn't. So you go away and think about it, but you can, you think about it once. It's a great discipline. So what do I learn from this? What will I do better next time? What can I build on? Then let it go. Because what people tend to do is over process. And that's where feedback is actually not useful because it's, you're giving people small uh, pictures of themselves and your image, your story relates to that in a way. And then they over process them. So they're constantly thinking about them and really saying, I wish I'd done better. And I wish I'd done better isn't a constructive thought. Um, I can do better next time by changing one thing is a constructive thought. So that, that I think they're really interestingly related to each other. So learning to manage your own confidence level is strongly connected to the way we receive feedback. 
that's so interesting. I had uh, I, on the podcast last week, I mentioned I, I, I did a speaking thing a week ago and I had an absolute personal nightmare in it. So I, had a, I, had a, I basically panicked in the middle of the meeting, in the middle of the, the presentation. Um, but, you know, very strange. But what I did immediately, I came off the stage and sat down, is I opened up my notes app on my phone and wrote down the things that I would do differently next time. So I almost straight away did exactly that. I did the reflection, wrote them down, and then put that away. I've not looked at it again. I still, I'm still, i still going back over it in my head that it happened, but I've actually captured all of the thoughts. And so all of the feedback that I got from the people that were watching was, A, they didn't notice that I panicked, and B, that they 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 thought that what the content was good. So that's the kind of like one-to-one -one feedback from the audience. And I've got my self-reflection already captured. So I, it, it really resonates with how, how you frame, frame that. I love that idea of capture it once, move on. It's quite important. Um, it's in job interviews, obviously, it's a field I'm familiar with. And having trained recruiters and then coached interviewees, uh, you can actually watch an experience like that and talk to each individual afterwards. And the and the, the person being interviewed will say, oh, I made all, all, all kinds of mistakes. I left stuff out. I don't think I presented very well. And the recruiter will say, yeah, it's fine. Just covered everything I needed. <laughs> Got all I wanted. Yeah. Now, that's the same event viewed, viewed through two exactly. totally different perspectives. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, just talking specifically about you for, for a minute, John, like what, what what sort of drives you to do that or what, what was the reason for sort of starting this? Were you on a personal crusade to make recruitment consultants better people? Um, you know, I applaud you for that. A little bit, <laughs> to be honest. And nobody's ever asked that question before, so good insight. A little bit, but no, actually, I, I was... Um, I was doing a role which was essentially a kind of research job, and I was writing lots of quite technical reports. And I was pay being paid really well for it, but I hated doing it. And that was a revelation that you can use a skill at a really high level and actually dislike it in intensely. So I, I wanted to make a big career change, and I looked around and I bounced around the world a bit and went on lots of different programs. And, uh, and I got really interested in how people change career. And I don't just mean apply for another job. I mean, really do what loads of people do in the modern world, which is to do something completely different. You know, and where I've landed on, and it's my interest, both of you, is that not so much, nothing to do with how you write a CV. It was how you think. And I was drawing on businesses, business thinking. You know, when a business rebrands itself or comes up with a completely new product or a completely new way of working, it's that shift of thinking. And I thought, gosh, this is really interesting. So how do I look at creative tools used in organizations and new ways of thinking and reframing and all of those tools and then get individuals to apply them to themselves? And I'm still working on that, still thinking of it. But that was my inspiration to, to share that thinking and to put that in a book and I remember saying to people, I don't want to be a career coach. I just want to write a book about career change. But of course, I had to try things out, didn't I? <laughs> I had to yeah. test out the material. So I did end up coaching people. And, uh, you know, that's what I've been doing for quite a while now. That was, I actually, uh, that does interest me. And I, I'd love to learn more about that. I think, um, I, you know, my dad was a, um, a CFO uh, many moons ago and I remember him introducing me to a book probably in my teens called what I think it's what color is your parachute or something like that is it yeah yep. yeah and I I was you know it was like the best book I've ever written uh read I was I was just I was fascinated by you know strengths and weaknesses and personality types and how this could relate to career and I think it has kind of emerged after my kind of more specialist career, let's say, um, it's emerged as an interest now. And definitely, you know, talking to Mike, sort of kindred spirits about um, how people think and work and strengths and weaknesses. Um, I, I, I saw you nodding when I said that, you know, you've obviously sort of aware of that book. Well, it's it's one of the ways I'd, I started the process and I trained with the author of that book. His, his name was uh, Dick Bowles. And he sadly died a few years ago. But, I mean, he, he did write that that is the best-selling career book that's ever been written. And I think it's slightly dated and it not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily work outside the US market all the time. But, I mean, it is a classic work. And I, I have to say that having 
I learned it not a huge amount from Dick Bowles, and I, I will always acknowledge him in every book that I write. There's something in it that, that that's really interesting. When you started explaining explaining that, um, I was thinking about something we talked about before, Chris, which is the Kodak story. And it's obviously what you're describing a little bit is self-reflection and being able to reflect on what you enjoy and what you don't enjoy and making decisions based on that. And the Kodak story that we've talked, that Chris and I have talked about in some in, in training is around how they failed to adapt to digital, how Kodak were a film or film company. And because they didn't stop and reflect and think outside of the box, even though they had all of the stuff, so they'd invented the digital camera, they'd invented the, the, the processor that everybody uses now to take digital photographs, they invented all of that. But because they thought of themselves as a film business and a printing business, they basically went bankrupt. Whereas it's basically applying the same kind of thinking, right? It's it's when these kind of big things come along, stop, think, reflect, make a conscious decision. Don't just assume and go with the flow. I think that's what I'm hearing. And I, I, yeah. Yeah, it's it's being adaptable. And I know that in the past we mentioned this, it's um you know, maybe this is another early career learning that I think when you're younger, you sometimes feel that, you know, you're going to get farther by covering all of your weaknesses. You know, like I've got a we list of weaknesses and I need to work on them. But actually what that book showed me was you're going to get a lot further if you actually just double down on your strengths and cover your weaknesses in different ways. Um, and that's that's a huge learning Um and sometimes you take your strengths for granted. So it's kind of like you don't think that, you know, they are a strength. Um, it's, I'm sitting here laughing because I've done exactly what you've just described today. So I had a meeting today with a, a, a new delivery manager that's just doing the team on the project that I'm working on. Um, and she's like, well, what, what, what can I do to help you? And I said, I'm a rubbish completed finisher. I start so many things. But I get to a point where it's like, it's good enough and I move on mentally. I said, if you can just help me finish things off, brilliant. And uh, it, it, so it's exactly that. And I literally had that conversation this morning. I love it. Look, um, it's at this point in the podcast that we we ask a related question. And um, we've already answered one of the questions. This happens quite a lot. We've already answered one of the questions, which is going to be around constructive feedback. But if you do have a, a question for myself or Mike, um, then do drop it to podcast at generationcfo.com who produced this. Um, but I'm just going to circle back to that a question on soft networking because uh, I, I love that phrase and I'd love to understand what you mean by that. Um, and maybe we can dig into that just a little bit. No, I'd be delighted to un unpack that with you. I, I also feature some of this stuff in a book I wrote called The Success Code, but it's definitely there in How to Get a Job You Love as well. Um, because I'm a, I'm a big fan of soft networking, or networking for softies, I, I sometimes describe it as. <laughs> why, why it is, because if you say to somebody, I mean, what, what what's the thing that people hear all the time when even, even mid-career, even if they're not even thinking of looking for a role, the, the most common piece of advice is you need to get out there and you need to sell yourself. So get out there is a particular particular form of behavior isn't it and actually it's extrovert dominant behavior so it's 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 suitable to a small percentage of the population it's more male oriented than female oriented so it's generally unhelpful advice so if you say to people well okay you might need to do some networking you can see their color change sometimes <laughs> and because of what they're picturing and they're picturing something that 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 mike you mentioned earlier which is the kind of you know, that un discom uncomfortable feeling of reaching out to people and bringing people cold or going to events, soggy croissants at dawn, you know, is, is one of the ways that these events are described as. And I often say, well, yeah, you don't have to do any of that. I mean, do that if you want to, but it probably won't work very well. So how do you do soft net networking? Well, it's about having conversations with interesting people. And you actually start with people you already know which is the great soft opening bit. So you almost have internal rule, rules of the game, which say, I'm never going to ring anybody cold. I'm, I'm not going to bother going to lots of events unless the event is brilliant. And I know I'm going to meet somebody interesting there. Or some, maybe somebody I've already got a connection with. But generally, you start with people you know. So let me share something I was working on just earlier today with one of my clients, which is 
he's coming back to me because I encouraged him to reach out to just three or four people. So three weeks ago, I said, give me the first names of three people that you've worked with in the past, easy to approach. You don't have to think about a script when you pick up the phone. And what you're going to do is have a conversation with those people about what's going on in their world right now. So it's not about you. You're not selling yourself. You're just discovering. The technical term for this is information interviews, but never mind. That, that doesn't matter. Just think a bit about having conversations with really interesting people. So you reach out to three three people that you know, and you're not saying, please look at my CV, or can, I, can you tell me if any jobs come up in your organization? What you're saying is, uh, what's your role like? right now? What challenges are you facing? Um, what's happening in your sector? What's coming down the line? What, what's just over the horizon? And suddenly you're getting loads of information about what's going on in particular sectors. You're picking up great language about what high performers uh, are doing and what how skills are described. And usually there's a kind of unstated social contract so if I were to ask you, Chris or Mike, if I were to do this with you, about 10 minutes in, you'll probably say, well, you know, you've heard a lot about me, John. Tell me a bit about you. What, what have you been doing? Rather like what we've do, been doing in this podcast. So you have a short statement there that simply says, well, this is my background, but this is what I'm really interested in right now. And I'm trying to find out more about X and Y. And that's it. You don't need a history. You don't need a, an apology. You don't need to tell people why you want to move on or how much you hate your boss or how bored you are in your current role. You just pitch that very short, simple statement. Um, and then at the end of it, if somebody says anything at all interesting to you, you say, that sounds fascinating. Who can I talk to to find out more about that? And you ask for a, a warm introduction. So, you know, I don't like bringing people cold. Would you just kind of email ahead, maybe help me set up the conversation so the next person you talk to already knows it's a safe conversation and know you're not going to oversell or, or take too much time. They know what it's about. And then you get bounced on. Of course, now you're being bounced on to people that you've never met before. And and if you're lucky, one of those conversations will lead to two or three other conversations. So you get an arithmetic uh, effect of this. But it just changes the way people are seen. It changes people's visibility. They learn a huge amount about what's out there. And strangely enough, it also works in terms of accessing the hidden job market. Because people just generally talk about you when you're not in the room and they say things about you which make sense and and the, the dots start to join. So it's it's really interesting. It's one of the things that makes a huge difference if you want to change career and only a minority of people do it really well. That That is so interesting because there's some, some not necessarily the whole bit of what you've just said, but some of those bits re really resonate. So people ask, People ask, why do I do the podcast with Chris? And part of it is to have conversations with interesting people in a way which is not cold calling. So like this conversation, we're having this conversation, it's fascinating, and you, we're building that network. Um, what The other bit that went off in my head is, well, how did I, how did I first meet you, John? Well, I was introduced to you by Kat, uh, Kat Jackson, and she's like, you need to speak to... So it's almost like what you're describing is witnessed by you you being here on this the only thing that i i can't uh attest to is whether people are talking about us nicely when we're not with them that's the bit i haven't worked out yet <laughs> but but how that manifests is like uh, back to the awards so last night at the awards there's quite a few people there who have been on the podcast so actually in that environment which i usually hate if i don't know anybody i knew loads of people through the soft networking of the podcast and meeting people so the conversation started started straight away. So uh, brilliant. I really like that. And I'm now going to pinch it and use it and call what I do that. <laughs> Feel free. Uh, I mean, the nice thing is it works for quieter people as well, because yeah. if you're an introvert, it's great defence to say, well, I'm, I don't like being pushy. I don't like talking about myself. So I'm not going to do any of this networking stuff. And my challenge to them is to say, do it your own way, but do something. And it, if yeah. that means reaching out to lots of people you know already, start there that's great Brilliant. yeah I, I you know i was nodding all the way through that i i you know we're, we're definitely kindred spirits there and i think there's a bit of um there's there is a bit of a trend in setting up of communities and i think community is possibly a solution to this as well um and i and it is what i do so you know i've obviously got a bias 
But when you say about, you know, having interesting conversations with interesting people, it's it, when you join a community, you kind of, you know, if there's a level of vetting, right? You you kind of know you're like-minded and, you know, the people that you meet are going to be similar to you. So you can, you can, hopefully you can meet someone that you, you know, you can sort of spark with. I think also that that sort of soft introduction and, you know, the hidden job market that you talked about, you know, so much of, of so much referral and so much kind of praise for individuals and support of individuals comes through community. And, um, you know, at a certain level, I don't know how important HR is to the process. You know, I know you work in that sort of recruitment environment, but if someone has met someone that they really want for a job, that's likely to happen. <laughs> Even if you put three or four CVs in front of someone to tick the HR box, right? Um, so I think that that sort of hidden benefit of of doing this is is super important um, because not every job is advertised for sure. Well, even if it is, Chris, um, what actually often happens is that somebody's already in the frame, and that could be an internal candidate, but it could be an external candidate that, that <coughs> the organization knows, the decision maker knows, through some kind of networking connection. So it, it op the, the job market operates in two spheres simultaneously, doesn't it? It's apparently transparent and clear because the role is advertised. But there's a hidden, the hidden aspect it doesn't always mean that um, jobs are filled without being advertised. Sometimes it means that people are already known. They're already on the shortlist. So, and therefore, they are preferred candidates. So that's often how it happens. And of course, in some cases, uh, an organization creates a job around somebody that they meet through the, exactly this process. Yeah. And it's another interesting point that you raised about you know, when people talk about networking and hard networking, there's there's almost this um, sometimes this perception that there's a lack of diversity, right? In in networks, um, it's the extrovert behaviour, as you said. It's potentially male dominated, um, but I think certain communities can actually really work on diversity as well. And um, certainly, what we found is the more diverse, the better. Um, people are almost self-opting out of the dare i say you know stale male and pale kind of kind of networking events um mm. whether it's a soggy croissant in the morning or a you know a sort of private dinner in the evening you know my dad belonged to a club in mayfair he always said to me this is going to be great for business you know and i was like no because people don't it's not inclusive enough mm. you know it pretty much excludes any woman that wants to be part of you know our meetings right so i said you know thanks but no thanks um so yeah i think it's i think it's really great and i'm definitely going to look up uh what was the book the 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 code was it the success code yes the success code okay fantastic another plug but all, all good <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on to good data bad data um so mike you were out and about last night and you stumbled across some good data well, it's 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 a very it's very personal to me right now, which is I, I mentioned I at the start. My kids are travelling up from Dorset at the moment, and they're they're on the on the trains. So I wanted to shout out for open transport data and open railway data, so I can literally look at where their train is, what's happening, when they're getting in, and I can also route route map to them across London to make sure we're meeting up in the same place at the same time because all that data is available. So, yeah, I mean. I remember, I remember, because I know I don't look it, but I am old enough to remember A to Zs and having to work through A to Zs. <laughs> um, and, and life is just so much easier now when, when you can just literally plug something in and magic happens and you can find out what you need to know. So, yeah, that's did, my good data. Did you ever have an A to Z where you turned to the page you needed and it had been ripped out? No, that's... that. No, oh, that, my God, that happened to me every time, which I think is why it sold so well. Because they had the perforated, they had the perforated bound, didn't they? And it was like people were ripping out of pages. So then you have to go and buy a whole new map. Anyway, that's a, that's an aside. <laughs> old old world problems, um, and bad data. So uh, oh, this is mixed. But so John, you know, a couple of months ago we talked about the the uh, post office scandal. Um, 
and you know it does keep on giving and the the mixed sort of news on this forensic accountants were sacked by the post office um for getting too close to the truth i think is the summary and um it it's it, it's great that you know forensic accountants are in there doing the job and you know trying to identify the issues but obviously there was this um there's this bad data around you know leadership basically ignoring or trying to sort of consistently steer away from um problems internally and uh i think the quote was you know i felt like i was dealing with a cover up as well and um i saw a really candid interview on this you know openly sort of criticizing the chief um about basically hearing and seeing the problems but having an ability to kind of just steer past it keep on steering past it and i think you can do that for lots of issues in your business you know you, you, it's almost like your job to keep on course you know set the direction the north star but there are certain things that you've got to stop and listen to right um mike see you nodding yeah yeah no so i I talked about the post office thing in the thing I was talking the talk I did last week, and I think that there was a, an interesting motivation within the post office that's kind of overlooked in this. It kind of it feels like the way it's reported and how we're talking about it, it's just a simple fraud. You know, it's just basically the post office were covering up. But actually, there's something that's been said that's not been picked up on, which is around they're, they're the UK's most trusted brand. So for them, their brand and their trustworthiness was so super important to them as an organization that actually they didn't want any bad news getting out. And they didn't want, so it's almost like the reason I think, this is my view, the reason that quite a lot of the decisions were made was not just simple ignoring the facts. It was, if this gets out, our brand and the trustworthiness of our brand will be absolutely destroyed. Clearly that's now what's happened. But at the time, that that feels like it was the motivation John, i don't know how close you are to this or how much you want to say about it but it's um you know it's shocking right it is i, I work an awful lot with my local sub post office i take stuff there two or three times a week and i noticed that the receipt for postage still says horizon on it because that's the mm. soft program so i actually said to, to our sub post mistress who i know very well i said doesn't it make you nervous when you, every time you see that printed she said you know really nervous because it's, you know, that sense of, is the screen telling me real information or is it or is it junk? And I thought yeah. that's fascinating. And the other reflection I'd say, which maybe relates to one or two people in this inquiry, is that in my experience coaching people in difficult situations, one of the most difficult situations to be in is being in an organisation where you are the one saying that the emperor has no clothes. Yeah. And, and particularly where somebody or a board are in a, in a bubble which is impervious, impervious that, is that the right word, to external feedback and information. This loops back nicely to what we said about feedback, doesn't it? That, so in other words, the, the reality is there, but nobody's letting it in. And if your role is to say to people, listen, this is, the, this is, this is the data, this is the reality, this is what's actually happening, and by doing that, you are um, really upsetting the apple cart or whistleblowing. My goodness, that's a really difficult position to be in. And I've seen people burned up by that. Um, you know, I remember somebody I worked with in the NHS who found out that one of her nursing colleagues had faked all their qualifications to get the job. And she got into a lot of trouble as a whistleblower. And isn't that really interesting? But organisations do not like it because they, as you've suggested, there is a sort of a sense of being intact and our brand matters and we're not re we don't really want to hear anything which ch changes our reputation. That that That's almost like my, you know, if I could do another podcast, I would do it on that subject because, you know, I, unfortunately I've experienced fraud in my career and... Um, it's it's tragic, you know. There's basically nobody gets convicted of corporate crime, um, and you know, face may be lost, and you know, fines may be put in, but it, it's it's never it sort of comes down to an individual level. This um, inquiry is obviously exposing people, but you know, let's see what happens next. It's uh, it, it's it's really um, 
it's a shame you know that, that individuals aren't held accountable in that space but anyway really interesting um I like the way he still managed to bring that back to uh feedback and coaching and and board dynamics um just just to wrap up um john you know obviously we talked about your books and and i'm sure people can search for those but if people want to um contact you where, where's the best place to go it's uh www.johnleescareers.com is my main website uh, i'm also on the faculty team for an organization called career shifters and they do an exciting launch pad uh, several times a year for people who want to change career um and all my books uh, are currently published by pearson so how to get a job you love it, love is on the pearson website excellent excellent and as a career changer myself i'm gonna have a look at that because uh yeah i certainly i think i learned the hard way <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i really appreciate that so um i think that's it yeah check out what john is all about obviously make sure that you're doing networking that suits you um you know maybe more soft and community based I, I really like that approach actually um network networking for softies as you put it but i don't know whether i'll, I'll borrow that catchphrase <laughs> <laughs> Mike's pointing to himself. Um, and uh, I appreciate the um, the feedback on the feedback uh, because I, I think um, I've certainly got a lot in my inbox after last night. <laughs> I'll, I'll view it with different eyes. Good stuff. So thank you um, to you, John. Uh, that's thank you from me. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, everyone. And remember, it's not all about the numbers. Bye, 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 bye.